Well, it's a privilege to get to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, can you guys see that all right? Okay. okay. Um, the, the challenge I have is that I was asked to speak on a topic that I often will speak four to six hours on. So uh, what I will tell you is I'm going to do some more of it tomorrow. Those of you who will be with us, so I'm not going to do all of what I'll do tomorrow, tonight. I'll save some for tomorrow. And I also have, we also have about six or seven hours of video on it as well that you could get at the wearesoma.com site. So hopefully what I'll do tonight is kind of give you a little bit of a taste. And I, I hope it will be helpful. Um, what I want you to do, if you would, is just start with Ephesians 4. While you're turning, I'll tell you a little bit about myself uh, in terms of my family. I, I'm married to Janie. We've been married for 21 years. And we have three children, Haley, who's 12, Caleb, who is 10, and Maggie, who is 7. And uh, we might talk a little bit about them tonight. Uh, but uh, they're a joy. And I've uh, lived in really three, main, three cities for the majority, for like my life. I don't really have, I have, I've stayed in some places. I lived in Spain for a little bit. But I grew up in Muskegon, Michigan, lived in Seattle for six years, then Chicago for six years, and then back in the Seattle area, Tacoma, for about 12 years. So, so I really feel like the Northwest is more my home. Most people say that I'm more European than I am North American. Um, I don't know if that's true, but I, th- I know that I came to faith when I was in Spain, so maybe that's part of it. So um, I was born there, so, so that's kind of fun. Um, not born physically, but spiritually. So, um, so anyway, it's great to be with you. And um, I'm gonna b- How many are you going to be with us tomorrow? Gonna, okay, that's great. Then I don't feel the need to do everything tonight. So I'd like to do enough that we could engage and you know, engage in conversations um, around this. So I want to start with Ephesians 4. And um, I'm just going to summarize the first part here, verses 11 and 12, um, that God gives particular per- people gifts to the church to equip the church for works of ministry. I think you guys probably have talked about that a little bit, but the idea that um, there aren't supposed to be a few who do ministry in the church. It's supposed to be everybody who ministers in the church, and, a, and ev- then there's some who equip those to do ministry. He goes on in verse 13, until we attain to the knowledge of the faith and of the Son, or the, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So the picture that Paul is trying to put in front of us right here is that we have the fullness, and the fullness is in Jesus. We know that Paul says in Colossians that Christ is the, the fullness of the deity dwelt in bodily form. So we, we have the glory of God in Christ. He's the complete, full everything. And Paul even says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. So like even that little gospel nugget you should walk away with with just great hope that you're not lacking anything. You have the glory of God, the absolute fullest glory of God in you, Jesus Christ. And so uh, that, that if we get anything tonight, it would be, um, make more of Jesus and less of you, and you'll be already be on a good trajectory. Uh, so, but then Paul says he, we want, he wants us to gr- we're going to grow up into Christ. And the idea here is uh, where Paul says as well in Colossians, we're to present everyone complete or mature. And the, the goal here is that our lives would reflect what's already true for us in the heavenly realms, that we'd live out what we already are, that we are already in Christ and that Christ is in us and therefore in a, in a sense we're all we're already complete in the heavenly realms and now what we're doing is we're bringing into our present situation what's already true for us in Christ before God the Father which is really good news because you're not trying to come up with something you're not trying to become something you aren't already you're trying to be what you are and when Paul talks about putting to death the flesh what he's actually saying is the old person shouldn't be the way you're defined anymore. There's this new person, and that's you in Christ. So I want to make sure that's clear because if you don't get that, then, then we will misunderstand the very heart of the gospel. And that is the gospel is really about a great exchange. You know, at the heart of the gospel is God substituting himself for us. If you're going to like summarize it, that'd be a great summary statement. You know, God substituting himself for us. Uh, in, in, a, in a sense, Adam wanted to substitute himself for us in the place of God, and, and Jesus comes as God and s- to substitute himself in our place as man. And he takes on humanity, human flesh, dwells amongst us, 
lives the perfect life we can't live, dies the death we deserve, rises again to be the new man that now in Christ we get to be. Uh, all because of Him. So it's all substitution thinking that I want you to think about. So like any time that, I mean, if I was just going to give you a nugget about gospel that you should apply to everything, you should keep asking, how is Jesus the better? How is, the, how is He the better life, the better obedience, the better righteousness, the, the better sacrifice, the better priest, the better king? I mean, the better, the better, the better. And we'll come back to that in a little bit. And that, that by the way, will give you just a little easy key to talk about the gospel. It's just to keep asking, how is He the better uh, in this? Because He's the substitute. He's the better of everything that we all need. Um, so so he's, Paul's saying, I want you to grow up in to the, the faith and knowledge of the Son of God. It's a, how is He the better? How, how is He sufficient? How, how do I walk in all that Christ is and all that Christ has done? Because it's already real. It's already true for us. You're a co-heir with Christ. You're seated with Him in the heavenly realms. At one point, Paul says, I pray that the eyes of your heart might be open, that you'd see this. You know, and that's his big prayer. So he says, I want you to grow up into that, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, craftiness, and deceitful schemes. So what he's saying there is, there should be no place for ongoing perpetual immaturity in the way we live out what's true for us in christ like we we got to grow up and into fullness into all that is true for us in jesus and i'm afraid that a lot of us just kind of begin with jesus but we don't continue in jesus so we're very immature in our understanding of what is true for us in christ and how it changes everything so hopefully even tonight you might grow up even more in what is true for you in Jesus, and what's uh, true for you now in the heavenly realm. So then he goes on, and this is the part I want to hit on. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. That's a lot. I'm not going to unpack all of it. I just want to get the, the kind of general thinking. He's saying... We speak the truth in love. That's the way in which we help people grow up into what is true for them in Christ. Now, what is speaking the truth in love? That's the big question because you want to know what that is and in order to be able to know what to do. And I, I find that people use that phrase in, in a way that's not intended, according to Scripture. You guys ever been with people and they're like, you know, hey, you know, like, I just want to tell you, like, you were funny earlier, but most of your jokes weren't really that funny. <laughs> just speaking the truth in love, you know? <laughs> Right? That's, that, was, that was a joke, by the way. Um, that's not what it means, but that's what we think it means. We think it means saying hard words in nice ways. That's not what Paul means. A good way to understand how you read your Bible is to always read your Bible according to your Bible. Like always, always understand the, the word in light of the text. So you keep going in the context here. You find out, move forward a little bit. I'm not going to read all of this because, again, I, I want to get to some of the nuggets here. Um, he goes, he goes uh, later in verse 19, talking about those who are not uh, um, in Christ. They're alienated from God because of their ignorance, harding of hardness of hearts, and stuff like that. They become callous. They're greedy. They're giving themselves to sensuality. But that's not the way you learn Christ, assuming that you have heard about Him and were taught in Him as the truth is in Jesus. So when Paul says speaking the truth in love, he's saying speaking... What in love? Jesus. Speaking Jesus in love to one another. It's, if you're going to grow up, what Paul is saying is, if you're going to grow up into Christ in all His fullness, then what you have to do is you'll have to speak Christ. In other words, people don't grow up into Christ by just giving them spiritual disciplines to do. By going to church, by teaching them doctrines, you, don't, you could actually know all the doctrines, go to church, read your Bible every day, pray, fast, give, serve, and never know Jesus. And how do we know that? Because the Pharisees did all of that as good as anybody, and yet they failed to come to Christ. And so you can, you can do all the spiritual activity and miss the whole point. The point is that you would get Jesus. That when you read your Bible, you'd find Jesus in the text, because it's all about Him, He said. That when you pray, you would realize how desperately you are in need of Jesus. 
And that Spirit would make Jesus known to you as you pray because He's the one who intercedes in your prayers that you would get to Jesus and Jesus would get to you. That you would be changed by Him. That when you fast, you would go, I'm fasting so I'd realize I hunger for such lesser things when I could feast on the bread of life, Jesus Christ. And so I hunger and thirst for Him. I get Him because He's the righteousness of God. And so, so that the goal of every spiritual discipline, the goal of your prayers, the goal of your community, the goal of all of it is that you might get to Jesus. And then the goal of our speaking to one another is that we might speak Jesus Christ into each other so that we would grow up into Christ. Here's what happens if you give somebody something other than Christ. You'll grow them away from Christ with good spiritual disciplines, in fact. You can grow them away from Him. So I know plenty of people who love the Bible and I hardly ever hear them talk about Jesus. How is that possible? I think it's because we've been taught to think that spiritual growth is going to happen through all kinds of means not through Jesus Christ. He is the hope. He is the one who's going to make it happen. So we want to learn how to speak Him. Let me just give you an example like um, what I mean by this. Like when you think about sexuality, are there anybody that's really young in the room? Okay, I can talk pretty openly. Okay. Yo, thank you. I need that. I don't know how it was for you guys, but when I was kind of being brought up in the church, there was also, first of all, there was a lot of shame in the culture I grew up in. It's like if you got someone, if you had sex and they got pregnant, you came up in front of the whole church and they made sure that everyone knew what you did. And Of course, if they didn't get pregnant, you didn't have to come up front, but it's kind of weird. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It was, but it was shame. You know, we used, they used shame to motivate. So you don't ever want to be in this place, right? And, uh, and, and then I would hear things like, you, know, you should wait until you're married to have sex because then you're, you'll have better sex. Did you guys ever hear that? Like your sex life will be better if you wait. So all these things that are just worldly. There's nothing about that that's Christian. There's nothing about that that's gospel-centered. The, should, should we have sex outside of marriage? No, I don't think so. But why? What, what do you give people as the reason for sexual purity? You know, I, I've heard even some people, oh, the Bible says it. That's good enough for me. That's not the only reason. There's far better reasons than just that. That's just rank legalism. Okay, there's something better. Now, that, now, the reason why I want you to think about this is how would you preach Jesus to sexual purity? That's what I want you to wrestle with. Like, do you know how to speak the gospel to every issue in life? Because Paul says here, we want to grow up in every way into Christ. Every way. So that every aspect of life is informed and formed by Jesus. Our sexuality, our money, our relationships, our parenting, our, our marriages, our work ethic, how we deal with our boss, I mean, everything, we should be able to speak the gospel to it. Now, you know, some of you guys are going, when, when are you going to talk about like, how we're going to speak to unbelievers about Jesus? Here's, here's my, my conviction. If you can't speak to one another about Jesus, you'll never speak to unbelievers about Jesus. Okay? You've got, if, if, if Jesus isn't in the, in, the, in the constant of your conversation with brothers and sisters who love him, then how in the world are you going to have a conversation with some people who don't yet know him and love him? So the question we've got to ask is, how do we make conversation about Jesus normative? Have you ever learned a foreign language? I'm going to come back to this, by the way, because some of you guys are going, how do you, can you talk, go back to that one? Uh, have you ever learned a foreign language, you guys, anybody? Okay, you know, did you learn it in a classroom or did you go learn it in a country? You teach. Japanese. So where's the best way to learn, where's the best, what's the best way to learn another language? Japanese With Japanese people, that's right. Immersion, yeah. right? I learned Spanish when I was in Spain. Um, you don't have to do that because they're all over the place, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't meant to be a uh, bad <laughs> comment. They're around here. So, the, But the best place is to be with people who speak it as, an, as their mother tongue, Right? What's the best way to learn gospel fluency? To be with people who speak it as their mother tongue. It is our mother tongue, by the way, if you're, if you're a child of God, because it's the very first thing you spoke in order to become a child of God. And we believe in our heart and confess with our lips that Jesus Christ is Lord, we will be saved. So it's like, it's, it, it is the means by which you express your new born faith, your new life. So everybody that's a Christian knows how to say it, otherwise they're not a Christian. 
Uh, by the way, that should be one of the things you start with is to say, like, if people don't know how to even share the gospel, they probably aren't saved. They probably don't know Jesus. If they can't articulate what he's, who he is and what he's done, we've got to back way up. In fact, I'm convinced that a lot of the church actually just goes to church. I don't know that they really know Jesus. Um, here's another thing I want to say before I come back to this. Um, I'm convinced that you never have to tell anybody to talk about who they love. So, I mean, I almost want to go, like, class over. Like, do you love Jesus? Are you impressed with him? Has he captured your affections? Do you rehearse how amazing he is to each other regularly? I mean, if you just started doing that, it wouldn't be hard to talk about him. Because I can tell you, when I first met my wife, I did talked about her, like, every day. People got tired of me talking about my wife. <laughs> They're like, okay, we get it. You love her. Just marry the girl. Because you don't have a hard time talking about the things that you love. So I, I think I'd even start there is, do you want to grow in your ability to speak about Jesus? Grow in your affections for Jesus. Stir up the passion of your heart towards how great he is. Second, you talk about what works. Okay? I mean, if you go back to Seattle right now, I guarantee you no one has to be told how to describe how the Seahawks bridged, you guys know Seahawks? It's a football team, they won the Super Bowl. How they, you don't, okay. <laughs> well, nobody has to draw a bridge guy diagram to talk about how they bridged the gap of not having the Vince Lombardi trophy to how they did it with Russell Wilson and the 12th man and how they filled the gap between. Like, no one has to draw a picture of that. They just tell you we won the Super Bowl. They tell you it finally happened. They, they talk about how it happened. Like, nobody has to tell anybody how we did it or how to talk about how we did it. You just talk about what works. You ever met someone who, like, started, got a new diet and it worked for them? Paleo diets. Did you guys have those here? Like, I meet someone who is on a paleo diet, and it's like the new salvation plan, you know? Like, <laughs> And they talk about it. They're evangelists for what they believe works. So you talk about what you love most. If I were going to encourage you to create an environment where gospel fluency is happening, talk about how much you love Jesus with each other. I mean, that's why we break bread and take the cup. It's to remember all that he did. You should do that often. And then second, ask yourself, does the gospel work? Is it the power of God for salvation to all who believe? If it is, it's changing you. It's transforming you. And then tell people what it's doing to you. Talk to people about how you are being changed by Jesus' power. I mean, just, these are basic things, but the beauty of it is you don't have to give someone a big class on how to talk about what they love and talk about what works. The question you have to ask is what do they love and what do they believe works? So if I were just going to back it up, I'd say start there with everybody. Do you love Jesus? You don't? Oh, let's talk about him. You know, the whole idea of having songs that we sing on a gathering is so that you would walk out with Jesus on your lips. So if the songs don't talk about Jesus, get rid of them. Like they, they need to exalt Him. They're about Him. This is about Jesus and what He's done. So uh, I, you guys got to meet. How many of you guys met Randy when he was here last? So what I love about Randy's preaching, he's, he's an okay preacher. He's still growing as a preacher. He'll get better, you know. But that's okay. I mean, you've got to have a lot of reps. He's brand new at this. What I love about Randy's preaching is he just says Jesus a lot. And it's not like he just says it just to say it. He loves Jesus. It just it's, it comes out of everything he does. That's a, that's, that's a great evangelist. Someone who loves Jesus and can't stop talking about him. Okay? Now here, let me just give you one other caveat, and I'm going to get to like mecha some mechanisms about this and how we can, you know, some practices you can learn. Let, let me just encourage you on something. You might ask, well, if we love him so much and we believe he really works and changes our lives, why aren't we talking about him? Because the enemy hates him. You need to understand, when we're talking about speaking the gospel, there is a battle going on. There's deception. There's confusion. There's doubt. There's all these things coming at you. Have you ever been in a, in a conversation with somebody and, and it, as soon as you think it probably should go to Jesus, it goes to something else? You know, you get into a b debate about politics or uh, abortion or gay marriage or whatever it may be. I mean, the, the friends that I have that I've been sharing the gospel with, it always goes away from Jesus really fast. Well, who do you think's doing that? The enemy's doing that. He's, he's at work. He hates Jesus. He hates Jesus getting fame and recognition. He's against him. And so you need to realize there's a spiritual battle going on whenever it comes to evangelism because the name of Jesus has power to save. And he knows that. So, so I, want, I want you to like just kind of like gird yourself up spiritually for the battle. Because if you aren't aware of that, you're going to go into conversations, you're going to go, 
You're going to go, how can we never talk about Jesus? You just need to understand, you are going to fight a war to get to the conversation about Jesus. There is a battle going on for the souls of men and women, and the evil one knows that if they get to hear about the greatness and amazing love of Jesus Christ, they're going to get set free. And he doesn't want that. So you've got to think of it like, okay, we're at the, we're at the cell gates. We got the key. We can open it up. And there's a bunch of people guarding the gates and they want to beat you up so you can't open that gate, open those, those prison doors and let out the prisoners. That's, that's where you're at when you start to share the gospel with an unbeliever. You're right at the door of the cell. You have the key. You can open it up. They can run out and go free. And the evil one does not want you to bring the key out, which is Jesus. Okay, that's, I just want you to know that because sometimes we're like, why is it so hard? Because you're entering into a battle when you start to talk about them. Does that make sense? If you don't embrace that, you're just going to go like, ah, just, I'll wait another time. No, you, you've got to realize these are souls that are captive by the power of the evil one. Now, God is powerful and mighty, and I believe he saves, but he does do it through you and I speaking the gospel of Jesus Christ. So know that that's going to happen, okay? Now, I'm going to get back to this. So how do you talk about Jesus when it comes to sex? Now, I want you to think about Jesus being the better right now. Okay, so how is Jesus better when it comes to this? You don't have to tell me. I'm gonna I'm gonna give it to you, but I want you to think about it. I want you to wrestle with. It. Okay, what about Jesus' life? What about his death? What about his resurrection? What about his eventual coming to come and get us? What about that future party that we're gonna have? Like, what about that speaks to this? That's kind of how I want you to think about every single issue in life. What about his life? What about his death? What about his resurrection? What about his second coming? What about the future new earth that we're going to enjoy with Jesus forever speaks to the issues of life? And that, that's how you're actually going to start doing gospel fluency on every topic is you're going to say, what aspect of Jesus do I need to speak into this situation? So let's try that, okay? So when it comes to sexuality, think about this. The God of the universe is pursuing his bride and she is unfaithful. And she's giving herself to everyone. That's us. That's Israel. That's the church. And what does God do? God courts her. God pursues her. He eventually needs to show up because he's kind of been doing it through a variety of means, sending messengers. I love you. I'm for you. Not, even having prophets you know, do it with some, you know, Jose and Gomer just to create a drama of what God's affection is for his people. And then, then what happens? Jesus shows up and he spends 30 years in quiet humility as a man, fully understanding his bride. Hebrews says that he was tempted in every way, just like us, but without sin. Remember when Peter says to husbands, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. If there's anybody who has an understanding way to how he understands us, the church, it's Jesus, because he spent 30 years living our life without any recognition. He went through it all. So you've got an understanding bridegroom, okay? And then what does he do? He pays for the bride with the, the price of his own life. The bride price is Jesus' life on a cross. And not, not, not only does he die on the cross to purchase her, but he sheds his blood to purify her to give her the most beautiful wedding dress ever. He pays for the wedding dress. How is it in your guys' culture? Does the brides usually pay for the wedding? Bride's family? See, I think we should change that. I, think, I have two girls, so I'm really working on this one. Um, <laughs> Because Jesus paid for the bride. And he paid for the bride's dress. And he's paying for the wedding. So on the cross, he dies, sheds his blood. The beauty of sexuality, anybody in the room, you don't have to tell me this, any in the room ever been in, impure? Your thoughts, your actions, lusting after somebody? Maybe, maybe even you had a fear. Or maybe you, you didn't wait till you were married. You, do you understand that Jesus shed his blood and you're pure? You're cleansed of your sin? You are seen as a holy, beautiful bride, as white and pure as she could possibly be. That's who we are in Christ because of his blood shed on the cross. And what's even more amazing is Jesus doesn't just purchase with his blood, but then he dies, he rises again, and he puts to death every enemy that could destroy this marriage. He's not going to let anything come in between us. He is committed. This is a covenant. It's a new covenant. Nobody can destroy it. He secured it. And what's even more amazing is you want to talk about a guy who's waiting to have sex? Jesus will not consummate this marriage until he comes, and it's been over 2,000 years so far. Talk about a faithful, de dependable, patient, loving man 
who is willing to be pure for his woman. That's Jesus. That's, you know why we want to be pure? Because he did it for us. You know why we want to be pure? Because we're telling his story with our sexuality. And you know, when we fail to tell the story well with, this, with our sexuality, we get to tell the story of his blood shed on the cross for the way in which we failed to tell the story well. And in either way, Christ is glorified, we are pure, and we can actually rejoice in sexuality in a way that tells something about Jesus. Okay, does that help? Is that okay? So I want you to work, I want you to think through, how can we do that with everything? We had a, a, one of our missional community uh, members come to one of our gatherings one time, and we were hanging out, and she was complaining about her boss. And by the way, I want you to enjoy. I want you to engage this with me a little bit. Um, so, so a bunch of people, you know, and you've probably been in these situations. She's like, um, "My boss is. He never recognizes me, and he's promised me a raise, and I haven't got it. And I was going to get a. I should have got a promotion, but other people get it ahead of me. And and what do what do we tend to do when someone does that? Yeah, we're like, yeah, that's horrible. You deserve better. Right? That's usually something like that, you know? It's a good Christian sympathy, you know? Um, how, how would the gospel speak a better word to her than just saying, yeah, you're right, that stinks? What's the better word? Great. Yeah. Yeah. So one, she's got someone who can sympathize with her. Yes, he was mistreated. He wasn't recognized. He got demoted. Now he ultimately got promoted to the highest place. Yeah. Right, so Jesus can understand it and enter into your... That, and that's fine. That kind of sympathy is great. But not you deserve better kind of sympathy. Because what does she... What, apart from Jesus, what does she deserve? What kind of paycheck does she deserve apart from Jesus? The wages of sin is death. Okay? Now we're going to get to the identity stuff, what's true of her. But the gift of God is eternal life. You, you want a better paycheck, you've got eternal life. You want a higher position in the company, where is she seated? With Christ in the heavenly realms. You, you, want, you want to have a, a better retirement package, what has she got? She's a co-heir with Christ. I mean, she's got everything. Now, here's what's even more amazing. She can work a terrible job and not even do well, but what does the Father say about her? This is my beloved, whom I'm well pleased with. Yeah. I, when I see her, I see her in Christ. Christ's life, Christ's performance is her life and her performance. Christ's death is in her place so she can get paid better than what she deserves. Christ's resurrection from the dead secures her a place forever in a new world that she's going to get to enjoy forever. I mean, this is... Really good news. So what does she need to know? She needs to know she's going to work for a better boss tomorrow. She works for Jesus. She does not work for this human boss. And what she needs to be reminded, she does not work for Pharaoh. Remember Israel? They actually believed they were working for Pharaoh. But God was still in charge of the whole deal. Right? So she needs to know, go to work for Jesus. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do all to the, to the glory of, the, of God. You work unto a new king. Not the old one, okay? So that's Jesus for work. And we can keep going. I, you're getting the idea of the better, the idea of the better, okay? okay I want to do a few more. Um, I'm going to have you help me on this one. In order to have gospel conversations with people, and, and by the way, right now we're primarily talking about how we do this with, with believers, okay? We're going to get to some talk about how we do it with unbelievers. But can I just say this before I go any further? Whatever you do with believers, you're really going to do with unbelievers too, Okay, don't, don't have like a different mindset. Like, okay, when I'm talking to Christians, I talk this way. When I talk to unbelievers, I talk this way. When you talk to a Christian, you're talking to them as a human that you need to understand, that you need to listen to, that you need to get to know the story of, 
that you need to understand how they need, you need to uniquely hear the gospel to their unique need in that moment, that's how you should speak to a Christian about Jesus. Exactly with a non-believer. The same thing. You listen to them, you get to know them, you get to know their story, you get to know their unique needs, so that you know how to share the gospel uniquely to where they're at. Don't, if you learn how to do it with both, you'll be great at evangelism. Okay? And let me ask this other question just to see if you're, you're following me. Who do you do evangelism to? Right. Evangelism is just heralding the good news of Jesus. Okay? So it goes to everyone, believer and unbeliever. You just learn how to share the great news of Jesus to whatever their need is in the moment. Um, I want to give you a, 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 something that's been really easy for me to teach people when I'm in a group. I want to encourage you to identify how you can be as a community a gospel metaphor. Okay? Now what I mean by that is, and we're going to practice this, think of all of the ways in which you could describe the work of Jesus on our behalf. Okay, what did he do for us? Okay, what kinds of things did Jesus do? Or how is he referred to? Like he's an advocate. Okay, give me some more. He's a substitute. Cool. He put himself in our place. He's a savior. He walked in and brought salvation where someone needed a rescue. He's a sacrifice. He was willing to give up himself for the sake of others. He's an example. Okay, so this is what it, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He's showing us what life should look like. He's the, he's the true and better Adam who lived the life a human should. Okay, as an example. What else? What is that? He's a healer and he brings wholeness. Great. We could, he's a rabbi, a teacher, great teacher. Okay. You said that because you're a teacher. He's the son. Okay. Okay, now, now if, if I were in a group and I was going, I want to help them grow in gospel fluency, I would have them make a list like that. Okay, let's make a list of all the attributes of who, who he is, what he's done, and then ask, where in our community, on our mission, could we show that to be true of Jesus by what, how we live, by what we do? I'll give you an example. I was, I was in a, and this is more of a personal one, less of a corporate one. Uh, I was in, uh, in a situation where the neighbor crossed our street. He doesn't live there anymore. Uh, he used to... He, used to, he put a sign up in front of his house like a permit parking only. And if you park there, he would glue a, glue a sign on your window that said something like, can't you read? And it was really nice. He actually was a seminary professor at the local seminary. So our whole neighborhood knew he was professing to be a Christian, but he was doing that to all these people. And uh, horrible, horrible. And so we used to take the first Sunday of the month Instead of gathering at the larger gathering with all the church, we would gather in our homes and have brunches for all of our neighbors. Because if you want to actually reach people that don't go to church, you do it on the time when all the Christians are in church. So Sunday morning was the time when we knew we'd get all the people who weren't a part of a church. And so they'd come over and have brunch with us on Sunday morning. And all these people are, the, are with us, but he's not because he's a seminary professor and he works at a Lutheran church and he's, he's kind of leading the liturgy. And so they start talking about him. And, and, you know, they're upset and they're frustrated. And, you know, they, they say, we think this, he, he has some military background. So they, they start making up stories like, we think he's got dead people buried in his basement. And, you know, he kills people. And he's just, he's crazy, man. I bet he's sniping us right now. And, and, uh, and I stop and I say, hey, we, we just had him over for dinner this last Friday. And everyone's kind of like, whoa, you're, oh, yeah, you're one of those Christians. Great. You know, I, and I kind of took a risk in identifying with him. Uh, and then I said, you, need, you don't know this, but he's actually a really nice guy. He brought my wife some flowers. He brought uh, a bottle of wine for dinner. We had a nice meal together. And I got to know his story a little bit. And he's been really hurt. Uh, I heard a lot about what happened to him when he was a young boy. And I, I'm not going to go into those details because you have to get to know him to find that out. But I will tell you that I think he cares a lot about justice because of the injustice that was done to him. I said, now, I don't think what he's doing is right. I think it's wrong. But I want to ask that we just don't tear him apart anymore. I'm hopeful that there'll be a day when maybe we could all be sitting at the same table and we might actually get reconciled. We might be able to see this fixed in our neighborhood. And so conversation ends. None of them are Christians, okay, that are at the breakfast. Next day, my neighbor across the street who uh, has not come to faith still, um, she pulls me aside and she says, and by the way, let me pause. It's not our job to save people. Okay, I want to be real clear about that. 
Hey, don't, do not feel the weight of saving people. It's not on your shoulders. That is God's job. Okay, and, and a lot of times I think we put so much, oh, I've got to do it right. I gotta, when am I going to do it? And, and you get so overcome with the kind of burden you're not supposed to carry. It's not your job. Your job is to be a witness to Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit and let the Spirit do what He wants to do through that. Okay? So I, I feel free about that. That's a good thing. It's not my job. It's my job to be a witness. It's my job to walk in the power of the Spirit. And I will hopefully do that with his help. So the next day I'm out in my, I'm out in my yard and my neighbor comes up to me and she says, I don't understand you. Why in the world would you defend that creep? And she used some other words that I'm not going to repeat. And, um, and I said, well, because he's not all that different than me. And she said, yes, he is. You're nice. And I said, no, hold on. Let me clarify what I mean. Right now, Jesus is before God the Father being my advocate. Apart from Jesus, I should be killed. My sin and rebellion against God is deserving of death. And right now, I have an advocate, Jesus Christ, who died on my behalf by going to the cross. He died on the cross for my sin. And right now, he's saying to God the Father, Jeff is loved. Jeff is a son. Jeff, I know, I know, the accuser's coming, telling Jeff he isn't. He is. I love him. I died for him. He's forgiven. He's cleansed. I said, Amy, right now, I have an advocate in a place I can't be to speak on my behalf a better word about me than is really true of me apart from Jesus. And the reason why I can do that for this man is because Jesus is doing it for me. Now, she hasn't come to faith in Jesus but she heard another way of explaining the gospel in a situation that was a gospel metaphor. Me being an advocate. Now, can you imagine if we were to live in such a way that you had to keep explaining it? So I, I, here's the, what I want to give to you that I think can be, make it easier to have more gospel conversations. Work hard at learning all the realities and truths of who Jesus is and what he's done. And then say, if we really believe this, and it really was changing us, then we would live it out in our lives in such a way that it would demand a gospel explanation. That you'd be living in such a way that your life wouldn't make sense unless you told them about Jesus. So here's the thing I'd even be asking you. Is your gospel community or missional community or even your family living in such a way that the world's going to look at you and go, you guys are crazy. You guys are weird. Why would you do that? Why would you defend a jerk like that? Because God's defending a jerk like me through Jesus right now. So 1 Peter 3.15, you guys are probably familiar with that verse, says always be prepared to give an answer for the hope that's in you, setting apart Jesus Christ as Lord. And what we, we tend to do is we tend to use that as an apologetic verse, like be ready to debate people about whether you believe in an old earth or a young earth or you know, whatever it may be that you're getting prepared for you know, to debate against Mormons or whatever thing you were taught. That's not what that's talking about. Because uh, it, what it's talking about is they were living a life that was so radically different and they were willing to suffer for the sake of Christ that people were going to finally go, what is up with you? Why in the world would you live this way? And so I want to I encourage you, ask, are you, are you, are you in love with him? Is, it, is the gospel changing you? And are you experiencing it? And do you know it well enough that you could actually live a life that would require you to explain the gospel to explain your life? Does that make sense? Okay, so... Gospel metaphors. By the way, that's not hard to teach God's people to do. Because you, you guys did it real quick. You came up with like 20 examples. We just took those and wrote them on the board and you said, he's a healer. Okay, well, are we visiting people in the hospital and praying for their healing? It's an evangelistic activity. Why are we not doing more of that? <laughs> what? Yeah, I mean, that's, that was the, like one of the means Jesus said that we were actually going to get to show the kingdom was to go pray for the sick. When's the last time we went and prayed for unbelievers that they'd be healed? We don't. What if they get healed? Then you go, hey, just, just so you know, he did that. Can I tell you more about Jesus and his power? And I think even in the room right now, we're going like, I don't think he heals anymore. Okay, so therefore, what we're actually revealing is our unbelief in the gospel. So now we've got to go like, do we believe the gospel works? Do we believe Jesus still is alive? Do we believe the resurrection and gave us power over sin, Satan, and death? And do we believe today he still can heal? I, absolutely. The scriptures are very clear on these things. 
Okay, there are the signs of the kingdom. The kingdom, the good news is about God's kingdom breaking into this world to bring new life where there's brokenness and death. Now, you might go, yeah, we've prayed for Christians to be healed. I, I actually am more convinced that I don't know that God's as concerned about Christians getting healed as he is unbelievers. Because we're already set. We're already going to get healed. Now, I, I think he does heal Christians, and I've seen him do that. But I have seen evangelistic fruit happen when you pray for people who don't yet believe and they get healed and you get to share the gospel. Okay? So think about, like, that, that's a real easy metaphor. Let's go pray for healing, and when it happens, let's explain that Jesus did it. But there's a whole bunch of other ones that you can think through. Okay? Um, I want to give you some examples. By the way, are you okay? Am I going too fast? I'm sitting there going, like, I've got to get this in in 45 minutes. So try, I know it's a lot. Um, you, you all right? Can I keep going? Okay, good. Okay, faster? Okay. <laughs> He's like, it's not enough. Let me give you a Romans 1. Uh, so I'm going to turn the corner a little bit to beginning to talk about unbelievers and how we engage with them. Hopefully I'm giving you some already. But um, you're right, Todd, this is a sticky board. <laughs> I just made a, a tornado on the board there. I... Um, I have learned that sometimes we try to cram too much into a conversation. Okay? Let me, just, let me just offer you this. If you talk less and ask more questions, you'll have more opportunities to share the gospel of Jesus with people. I promise you. Ask more questions. Draw out the heart. I was talking to the guys before we came here, and we were talking about how do you get in those conversations. I said, when, especially for guys, think about how often guys, when you're with guys, what do you usually focus on? Something else, right? Sports fixing a car, whatever it may be, it's usually, it, David, come up here. It's usually this kind of thing. It, usually guys stand like this, and it's there. I mean, we might talk to each other, but we're talking about something out there. We're not talking about this, okay? So what I want to do, like, guys, I'm going to encourage you. Get to know them by getting to know something out there. That's fine. Build some trust, sports, whatever it may be. But at some point, you want to say, David, tell me about you. Now, not exactly those words. You can have a seat. I'm just, we, 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 we need it. Yeah, we, we, need to make this, we need to make the shift to saying, how are you? What's going on in you, your life? Tell me about your, your background. Tell me about your family. Tell me, how'd you get here? It, start drawing them out. You're never going to be able to talk to someone about Jesus effectively to their real needs if you don't actually know them. I know this, this should be like obvious, but I'm just telling you like, we usually try to cram a message into a person we don't know yet. But if you know them, I mean, the best example is that how many of you have kids in the room? Like you, you, right now as I'm talking, you're probably going like, man, my kids need to hear something about Jesus today. And if I were to keep talking about my kids and give you a lot of illustrations, by the time I'd, I'd be done, you'd be going, I've got to get home. My son or daughter needs to hear something right now about Jesus. Because you know them. You know where their needs are. You know where their doubts are. You know where their fears are. You know where their struggles are. You know, you know them. You can't effectively talk to people well about Jesus if you don't know them. So I would encourage you, listen a lot more. Second, be more provocative. Okay, and there's two ways to be provocative. Well, there's hundreds of ways to be provocative. Let me give you, <laughs> yeah, be careful about how provocative you are. Um, when, I, when I say that, don't give them everything. Don't feel like you have to get a, a four point, three point, whatever message in and then close the deal. So like I, I, I love to like lead people. You know, like I, I remember a um, conversation I had with a guy one time and he was, he was talking about his work and all that and he was talking about, um, you know, like his, uh, he was getting his identity from his work and he lost his job and was really struggling with who he was and as we were talking through it, um, I said, hi, so how are you feeling? He said, yeah, I just don't know who I am anymore. And I said, wouldn't it be great if you could have some kind of security that would give you an identity that could never, ever be taken away? Yeah. And that's where I left it. Because what is he doing? He's going, why do you say that? Okay, now here's the thing I want you to, I want you to realize. That you pay attention to what Jesus did. He didn't always say everything. Sometimes he asked a question. Sometimes he just created a new, a new a kind of a new category of thought that someone never had before. 
And, and this is what we're doing in friendships. We're creating new categories for them. Because we know the answer, right? There is a way to have a security that can't be taken away, and that's finding our identity in Christ. Now, he might go, and sometimes this happens, well, why did you say that? Or do you know of something like that? And, yeah, I do. <laughs> and then you leave it. I, what, I, what I've learned in evangelism is sometimes I feel like it's my job to keep the conversation going. But I, I want to tell you, like, if you ask provocative questions or make provocative statements, the conversation will keep going if they want it to. And if they don't want it to, all you're going to be is doing is forcing a conversation anyway. So be provocative. You know, it's like, d- just know the kingdom of God is so attractive, so amazing. If the Spirit of God is at work and you just ask key questions, it's just going to draw them in. But what we tend to do is we just tend to slam them away because we try to do way too much. Okay? So be creative. Be patient. Trust that God's at work. It'll really free you up, by the way. You actually kind of start having fun with it. You know, like, you know, like, hey, man, you know, like, I, I've, I've, I've had, like, I've had guys talk about, like, don't you ever worry about money and the market? I'm like, no, man, I got a rich dad. <laughs> and then you just stop and you don't go any further. And like, he's got a rich dad. I wonder what his dad does. <laughs> he may not talk to me about it again, but I can, maybe it'll come up later. Or it, with my wife and I, you know, like, they've been with, people watch my, my relationship. They'll see us fight and, you know, they don't always see us make up. But, and they'll go like, man, you guys have been married 21 years. What's the secret? Oh, man, a long time ago I found out a secret to a marriage that will never, ever end. It's amazing. And then you leave it. <laughs> like, be provocative. Create an opportunity for them to hunger for more. And the beauty is, you and I have the answer in Jesus to every single need of every single human on the planet. You've got to believe that. If you don't believe that, then there's no good news. But you have the answer to every single need. I mean, I, I think it was Tim, Steve Timmis used to say this. Like, what's the question? Jesus is the answer. What's the problem? Jesus is the solution. You've got to learn how to think that way and to really believe it. If you don't believe it, then, I, I mean, then you're, you don't understand the fullness of what we have in Christ yet and pray the Spirit would give you that. That he'd open your eyes to how amazing it is to have Jesus. Because he is everything you need. And he answers every question you have. And he solves every problem you'll face. He really is all of that. And if you believe that, then you'll be eager. You'll be like, man, I can't wait for another problem. I can't wait for another, another question. I can't wait to create a question. Create questions in the people's hearts that you're with. Remember Jesus at the, with the woman at the well? I have water that you know, never ends. That's exactly what he's doing. She's like, wait a minute. Are you greater than, than our fathers? You know, like, th- I mean, who are you? you? You think you can just, they dug a well. You don't have any, any way to d- dig a well. What are you talking about? And then he tells her about what he's going to do and who he is. And he, he says stuff like, yeah, I, I know about you. I know, I know that the one you're with isn't even really your husband. That's prophecy, okay? By the way, some of you might need to grow in listening to the Spirit and saying, God, will you give me insights into what's really going on in people's hearts? And so when I say it, they'll go, how in the world did you know that? You know, when I preach, I always, every time I go up to preach, and I I want to say you can do this in anything in life. It's just not when I get up on a platform. But I say, God, would you help me to say something that when someone hears it, they'll know that I couldn't have come up with it myself? And they'll go, how did you know? Did you read my mail? And I usually know that there was a prophetic word given when someone comes to me after I preach and they go, "Did, did you talk to someone about me? Because you said something that nobody should know, and it would hit me exactly where I'm at. I'm like, that was the Lord. That was the Spirit of God. Now, what am I doing when I, when I say that? I'm saying God knows. God's real. He's alive. The resurrection really happened. Jesus is presently working in your life right now. That gives great hope to people who are wondering if God is alive and knows them and cares about them. That, now, that can happen to unbelievers all the time. It really can. So pray that God gives you insight. Pray the Spirit gives you unction. Pray that he, d- he puts divine knowledge into your mind about a person. And then go like, hey, I, I just had a weird thought. And we, sometimes that's really from the Lord. You know, have you guys ever had that happen? You're like, I just, I just had this weird thought. I, I don't know if this is true, but I thought, I think I'm supposed to ask you, like, how's, how, how's your relationship with your daughter? And all of a sudden it's like, How'd you know? We just had a big fight. Well, I, 
you know, I have a relationship with God and sometimes he gives me insights into people's lives and it seemed like that might have been for you today. And then you leave it at that. You, maybe you go, can I pray for you? Or, you know, by the way, evangelism, pray for people. Pray for healing, but pray for people. Well, it's one of the things that, we, do you guys understand? We have access to God for people. What a great evangelistic tool. Hey, can I pray for you? And just start to do that for people. Now, they might go, no, I'd rather not. Well, if it's okay, I'm still going to do it. I just will do it on my own. <laughs> and you let me know how that goes. Yeah. <laughs> so, so slow down. Ask questions. Be provocative. Don't try to give them everything all at once. Um, I want to tell you about my friend, Zia. He hasn't yet come to faith. But um, as he and I were engaging in these kinds of conversations, you know, we were hanging out together. We were having meals together. We both liked soccer, so we were kind of t- doing soccer together. I started playing on an indoor soccer team with him when I could. He started coming to some of our cookouts. Um, and then I, at one point, I just, said, I just asked him, hey, would you like to just get together for breakfast once in a while? And he said, yeah, that'd be great. So we started going out for breakfast, and each time I asked him a little bit more about his life and about his family, about his father and about his mother and all these things, and I just got to know him, and he started to open up his life to me. Which, by the way, everybody wants to do that. Thank you so much. Everybody wants to be known. Okay? And I remember, this is a tool I want to give you. Romans 1 is a, is a great evangelistic tool. Okay? Uh, let me just tell you how you can use it. And I've, learned, I've been learning to do this more. I, I, after I, got, I was with him for a while, I said, Zia, I want to let you know that every single human being is a worshiper. I said, now I want to define what I mean by that because that might sound like weird to you, like some religious thing. And he, he's got nothing to do with any religion whatsoever. I mean, his dad is Muslim, but he didn't, his dad was not really that involved and his mom's got some kind of weird stuff, a mixture of like three or four religions, but Ziad has nothing to do with any of it. And um, I, I said, everyone's a worshiper. What I mean by that is that everybody builds their life on or upon something to the point at which it becomes the fulcrum or the, the center weight of their life. It's the thing that they trust in the most. It's the thing that they look to the most for significance or approval or whatever it may be. And I walk, walk through that. And, and I said, so let me just explain what happens. If what you worship is not God, then God gives you over to that to show you that it's not a very good God. So he turns you over to that And what you end up doing is you want it to do something for you only God can do for you, and it doesn't. So then you want it to do, you want it so badly to do for you what God can do, you start to lust for it, which means you long for it to give you something it was never meant to give you. So you lust for it, you want more of it, you want more of it. People do, some people do it with alcohol, some people do it with their work, they become workaholics, some people do it with their kids. They put all their pressure on their kids to be perfect so they'll feel better about themselves as parents. We do it with all kinds of things. We do it with our spouses. But we, we all do this. Every one of us has done this. And I said, and then what happens is God, God knows that we're not getting it. So then he gives us over again, and we begin to do all kinds of things with that thing that we ought not to. We, we kind of pervert it. We take what was a good thing, and we make it a perverted or broken thing. So we, we try to manipulate it. And I said, the example that's used in the Bible in Romans 1, God uses sexuality and how we do that with sexuality. But we do this with all kinds of things. If it's our kids, we try to manipulate and control them. If it's our marriage relationship, we try to make them something they were never meant to be. But either way, we, we try to make a good thing into a God thing, and then we try to manipulate it to be our God the way we want it to be. And it doesn't work. And then God gives us over another time to do all kinds of crazy things and have wrong thoughts in our minds about them, and it leads to hatred and anger and bitterness and rage, and, and it, it breaks the thing that we loved and we wanted to be God. It ruins that thing for us. And I said, do you have anything like that in your life? Anything that you worshipped or looked to like that? And he goes, that's my dad. I've been wanting my dad to approve of me. I wanted my dad to accept me. I've been wanting my dad to like finally be proud of me. And I've gone to school and I've worked hard and he still isn't. And I said, where are you at with him? He goes, sometimes I just want to kill him. I said, that's, that's the result of you looking to your dad to be your God. He goes, no, no, it's my mom. And he goes, tells me all about what it was, how his mom became that for him. And he goes, after he does that, he goes, no, it's my girlfriend. And he, he just kept going. I said, 
now, and he and I had been talking enough because I realized he, was re- he told me he was really anxious and his body was experiencing all kinds of like problems. And I, at one point I said, do you understand what's going on? Your physical body is now falling apart because you're trying to worship three gods at the same time and none of them are good gods. Now here's, what, here's the reality. God says that the wages of your sin, the wages of your false worship, your wages of what, what happens when you worship something other than God is death. And God is giving you an experience of death right now in your relationships and in your physical body because he knows that if you don't wake up and turn to him soon, you're going to eventually experience this kind of spiritual death forever. He loves you way too much for that to happen. And so I just want to encourage you, Jesus, when he died on the cross for your sin, he died for the way you worship the wrong God. And he wants to forgive you of that, and he wants to rescue you from that, and he wants to deliver you from that, so you can find your, your real hope and your real desires in God alone through Jesus Christ. And he just stopped. He was like, never heard that before. I go, you think that's true? Are you experiencing the wages of your sin? He goes, yeah, it's killing me. I said, do you want to turn to God now in Christ? Put your trust in Jesus that he died for you? And he goes, no. Because <laughs> I don't believe it. I said, all right, I'm going to keep... I'm here for you. I will always be here for you. When, you. when you want to talk more, we'll keep having breakfast. And he still has not come to believe in Jesus. I remember at one point we were talking, he goes, I want to believe. I just can't. I said, well, I'm going to pray that you will. I'm going to pray that the Spirit of God will waken you up, wake you up to, to really see the truth and come to believe. Now, I give you that because I think we've been trained to like have one kind of way to do evangelism. There's literally hundreds of ways in the Bible the Bible is all about evangelism, just so you know that. Like Romans 1 is an evangelistic passage about what happens when we, when we worship a false god. You could talk to people about that. You know, you're going to have to explain what worship is. That's part of what you have to do is you have to explain terms. You have to enter into their turf. You have to know them well enough to be able to engage that. Okay? Yes? We had been having breakfast enough times, and um, at, at one point he, he was talking a lot about his physical ailments. He was really anxious. He wasn't sleeping well. And, um, and so then I just said, let me tell you about this, uh, this idea of, of you being a worshiper and that what you're experiencing is the physical ramifications of your false worship. So. And he said, you know, that makes perfect sense, but I don't believe it. And that's when you know, like, that, that only God can save. Like, only God can make him have that kind of faith. Because I, I, I did as best I know how. And it didn't matter. So that's, that I feel, don't feel the weight. That's what's beautiful about that. I just go like, Lord, it's up to you. But you know what? I guarantee you, he now has a new process to think through. Like, every, I, my prayer is, is every time he looks to something to be God and it fails him, I go, I wonder if that's happening. And I, I pray that everybody's gods fail them all the time. So that's not a bad thing to do, by the way, to like, to, because that's God's will. It's right in the word that, that our gods would fail us so that we would, they'd be revealed to be what they really are, and that is they're not gods at all. So pray that people get turned over uh, to their false worship in such a way that it actually leads them to Jesus because it doesn't work for them. So, okay. Um, so I need to take a break or I'm... Is that enough? And we'll do some q and I got one more thing I can do, but I'm just, do you want me to do one more? Okay. <laughs> okay. I am like, it's like fire hose on you right now, so I'm sorry. You okay? Um, two more. Look at you guys. Three, four. Some of you guys are going, I want to go home. Isn't the gospel of Jesus amazing, though? Like, I, I, like, well, let me just back up. Can I encourage you, whenever you're with people that love Jesus, to talk about Jesus? Like minimally, if you, if you end up walking out of a time of get with a bunch of believers and Jesus doesn't come up, you ought to just like call everybody and go like, I am so sorry that I didn't lead us to worship our king today. Like it should, he's the, he should be the topic of the conversation. I mean, no matter where you're at. And work at that. Grow in that. Like spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Well, how do you do that? You keep talking about Jesus. with one another. You remind each other what you have in Christ. I mean, Paul doesn't write a letter without like doing a big diatribe of worship at the beginning, and usually it breaks out at least two or three times in the middle of the letter just to remind them one more time of what they have in Christ. Keep bringing it up because people won't know how to talk about Jesus in winsome ways if you never do it with them. 
And the beauty is, if you're in community that does it, you'll all get better at it. You know? Like, hey, let's take a moment. Let's talk about what Christ means to us right now. Let's take a few minutes. Let's talk about his life. What do you love about Jesus' life? Now, I hope that what you're hearing me doing is I'm just giving you the elements of the gospel every time you're like, his life. Talk about his death. What does his death mean to you? What about his resurrection? Isn't it great he's going to come again? I'm so excited he's given us a brand new earth. Oh, and that feast we're going to have with him, what a party that's going to be. And just rehearse it over and over and over again, every element, and talk about it. I mean, if you, just talk, you could talk about Jesus' life forever. We will. Think of all he's done. It's amazing. Try an exercise like this. Pick a topic with a group and just go, Okay, the topic is, and you, it's work, or it's money. Okay, then say, okay, let's, let's rehearse everything about Jesus that should help us rethink that thing. Okay, that'll grow people in this. It's, it's kind of like, if you're going to learn Japanese, not only do you talk about it, but you have to learn the vocabulary. You have to learn grammar. It's like, we have to do the same thing with, with Jesus, with the gospel. Talk about every aspect. Get all the vocabulary down. Every way in which you can talk about how great Jesus is, you should rehearse that. And the beauty is, if you do, you'll just be worshiping him anyway. It's not like an empty exercise. By the time you're done, you'll be like, ah, it's amazing. It's our king. Like, that's how it should be. I mean, how many of you like to talk about your kids? And you're like, oh, my kid, he's so amazing. He's good at soccer. It's easy. Jesus is so much better. So much better. If you don't believe that, then you don't know him. In fact, your kids need Jesus to be better because if he isn't, then they have to be. You know, but when you can tell them, you know what, son, you have a, there's a better son, and he is in your place, that, which means you are just like Jesus. You are loved just like Jesus. You are accepted just like Jesus. Even when you fail, you, are, you have Jesus' life. Don't you love that when Paul says it to Galatians, like, it's by the faith of the Son of God. We live by the faith of the Son of God. It's not just the obedience of the Son of God. It's the faith of the Son of God. It's the way he believed, the way he trusted God. My, I, I ask my, my kids regularly, I say, who's your real dad? And they go, not you, dad. Because <laughs> they need a better dad than me. And Jesus shows us who the better father is. And so I regularly tell them, I'm not your real dad. Your real dad is your heavenly father. I'm just the means by which God brought you into this world. And I'm to show you what the father's like, you know, and... And I'm not always going to show you what he's like, and that's why we need Jesus, because only Jesus can perfectly show you what God the Father's like. So when I fail, we're going to both look to Jesus together, both for my forgiveness as well as for your example. And when I do well, we're going to know that's because Jesus is living his life in and through me, and so we're going to give him credit for the way that I am a good dad that day. It's like, that's how I, I'm teaching my kid to make it all about Jesus over and over and over and over again. Think, just keep, keep working on that as a group. That, if you can do that with each other, then when you're talking to a friend and you listen, you get to know what's going on in their life, you're going to right away go, I know what they need because Jesus meets that need that they're struggling with right now. And if you get good at talking about it with each other, which by the way, we have a, we're a grace culture. So you're like, I, I'll, I'll practice every once in a while. I'll go, okay, pick a topic, group. Okay, let's talk about how Jesus is the better and all of that. And they start doing it and someone will say something you know it's not right. And Okay, group, what do you think about that? Well, that didn't sound like that was Jesus. Man, that sounds like something else. Okay, well. Is that right? Remember, we're full of grace. And so you, you create a culture. Of all the people who should be able to practice this, it's us with each other. Okay. By the way, let, let, me, let me give you one more thing before I give you that. You said two. I'm going to give you two. So, um, so oh gosh, gosh. I'm okay. I don't know if you're okay. Um, pay attention in your groups to whenever a topic or concern comes up and Jesus doesn't become the hero in that moment. Okay, I want to give you an example. Like, like, it's not just did you talk about him. Was he the hero? You know, was, was he the rescuer? Was he the savior? Was he, was he the one that everyone got amazed with all of a sudden? We were, we were having a conversation with a single mom in our group, and her hus- ex-husband was just, he's a real case, and it's not been good. And, and so she was complaining about him. And, of course, like all the guys in the group are like, let's go get him. Let's go beat this guy up, you know, and... And uh, they're just and they're just nail. They want to nail them. And and I think there's a, there's kind of a righteous anger about men who don't treat women well. I think that I think we can feel that. God doesn't like that either. 
But what they did is they started making it all about the guy. And so everything started being talked about. How are we going to, do we need to bring him to court? Do we need to, what do we need to do? And at one point I stopped and I said, hold on. Wait a minute. Who's the hero right now? Who's the one that this became all about? Did it become about Jesus or are we still talking about this guy? And I said, well, it's all about the guy. And I said, what is, her name's Elisa. What does Elisa need right now? Does she need to be, have this man be the center of her life or some other man? Because if we keep making it all about this guy, we're telling her that guy has the kind of authority and power in her life to destroy her life. When we know there's someone who's a better man and has more power. So can we shift the discussion to start talking about how Elisa needs Jesus, not us to go beat her, her husband up? Like, that's not what she needs right now. She needs, to, she needs to realize she is worshiping her ex-husband. And I stopped and I said, Elisa, how much control does he have over your life? And she said, every bit of control. My days are good or bad based on what he does. And we said, I, said, I just asked her, do you want to be free of that? Or do you want to continue to submit to that? She said, of course I want to be free of that. I said, you can be. I want to talk to you about repentance. Repentance is when you turn away from something that was, be, was your God to somebody who is truly God. And right now, your ex-husband is the one you're still looking to to be your God because he is the controlling center of your life. I said, group, how can we lead her to Jesus right now? And so we, we said, repent. And, and you're, the only way you're going to repent and turn to Jesus is if the Spirit tells you he's a better husband than the, this one. So can we talk about how Jesus is an amazing man for you right now? And they just started to talk about Jesus. He, he's your protector. He's your provider. He's never, he will never leave you or forsake you. He is with you. He understands you better than anyone. He grieves with you. He hates what's going on. Of course he does. It's terrible. But we can't fix it. He can he can heal you. He can, he can restore you. He can meet you in your deepest needs. He can af- pour affection over you that you've always wanted your husband to give you, but he never will. Only Jesus can. And we began to make Jesus the hero in that moment. We said, turn from your husband. Turn to him. Now, there might be things we have to do and talk to your husband about, but if you don't turn to Jesus instead of your husband, it ain't going to matter what we do to him. He's still going to be your God. And that's what you need to be free of. Yes. But fear is, fear is another form of worship. Yep. That's why at the beginning... F- yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. Think of fear this way. Fear is whatever you think is in front of you that could control your world. That, that's why the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So uh, we, we tend to think of fear as like, it's just, I'm, uh, um, well, I don't know how we think about fear, but I've been learning to think about it a lot lately. Because I've, I've struggled with some things that I've feared in my life. And I began to realize I was actually fearing something that wasn't, but fearing something that could be. That's what fear is about. It's about what could happen. It's always what it's about. Because if it's happening, there's not a fear in it. That's just a reality. You know, now it's like pain or it could be other things you're experiencing, but it's not fear. Fear is about something that could be, that could happen. And so the reason why the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom is because you're saying, I'm trusting him for my future. I'm trusting him for what could happen. I'm going to put my trust in him. So that, that's really what fear is. It's where you place your trust for what could or could not happen. And so what was going on for her is she's, the fear, and it, for her it wasn't just fear, just so we're clear on that. For her it was anger. She didn't like that he was treating her poorly. She, she didn't like how, you know, like he, it seemed like he was trying to manipulate to get the kids in certain time. I mean, there was just a whole bunch of inconveniences that she didn't like that he was bringing into her life. He wasn't hitting her. He wasn't, it wasn't physical abuse. So it wasn't that kind of stuff. But, but there still might have been fear there, you know, but fear is connected. You, you, you fear most what you love most or you think could, could take away your love. Take away what you love most. So like if you love your kids most of all, then you fear whatever could threaten your kids. Okay? So whatever you love most will be connected to also what you fear most because if you love your kids most, then you'll fear losing your kids or what could happen to your kids. So then you're afraid of schools, or you're afraid of, you know, cities. Because, man, what could happen to my kids? Now, it doesn't mean you throw a band into the wind and you go like, go kids, kill yourselves, you know. But, but fear that controls you is connected to what you love most and what you fear most, always. So if we can have the fear of the Lord be the most controlling p- center of our life, 
then we also have the love of God, which casts out all fear, the other kind of fear, because it has to do with punishment. You know? And so then, we, then we're in the safest place. That makes sense? Okay. I don't know if I lost where I was going. Okay. So I want to give you, everybody has this storyline. Have you guys seen this before? Maybe, David, you've done this before. Have you done this? You have? So I'm just repeating. Okay, then I, do you want me to do it anyway or not? Have you done the whole thing or? Okay. In a straight line? Sorry. Oops, we don't want that. Okay. So, so if you guys all know it, then we're just going to practice it. Okay. So everyone has a, this storyline in their life. What's the creation part of their storyline? Yeah, origins. It's my identity, origin. What is it that I look to to kind of define who I am? What's the fall storyline? Yeah, why is my life broken? What's my problem? What's the redemption part of the storyline? Yeah, what's my solution? We're going to get to the gospel answer. I'm just, And then new creation, what's that? What's my ultimate hope? When all is as it's supposed to be, what, what will my life be like? Okay? Now, everybody has this storyline. So, like, a single person who wants to get married, what's their identity in, potentially? Yeah, I'm going to get a spouse. So, so if, I find, if I find a boyfriend or girlfriend and we get married, that'll be, that will give me my sense of identity and significance. Okay, what's the problem? I'm not. Well, it could be a lot of things. I, I always pay attention to our women who are wanting a, a guy really badly, and they're like, the guys are jerks. Nobody pursues me. You know? And they, they'll just give me like 45 different things that's wrong with men, you know, in our city. And it just, I mean, it, it's like boom, 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 boom. And usually I just say, okay, let me just ask, if a guy never pursues you and you never get married, will you be okay? If the answer is no, then they really think their solution is, this should have been probably marriage, I guess. Their savior is a spouse. Now all of us who are married go, are you kidding? (laughs) Do you not understand what you're asking for? You want them to be your savior? They're just like you. They're looking to you to be a savior too. Like you guys are going to kill each other. (laughs) So we know that doesn't work. And then the ultimate hope is, you know, life happily ever after type of thing. And we know it's a a fairy tale. I mean, marriage is great. I love it. And I'm thankful to be married. But it's the hardest thing I've ever done. I mean, it didn't didn't complete me. It undid me. (laughs) That's what it did. (laughs) It tore me apart in the best possible way. It's God's sanctification in my life. But so so let's just, let's just, could we tell a new storyline for the person who wants What's a gospel-centered storyline for someone who would like to have a spouse? Now, is, is getting married good? Absolutely. So we don't want to ever say what God has called good, bad. It's a very good thing. But when it's a God thing, it's a bad thing. That We, we make it to be a bad thing at that point. So what, 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 someone who's wanting to find their identity in, in, in marriage, what do we get to tell them? What's the gospel storyline for them? It's the good news. Huh? Yeah, we... That's right. Our solution is the bridegroom. We have... We, there is a perfect spouse who's pursued us. We already went through that earlier. So we've got that. What is our real problem? Well, he's not here yet. Well, he is here, isn't he? What? Huh? Unfaithfulness. I'm on. I'm the. Un, I'm the problem, not him. He's present. He's available. He's given himself to me. The problem is that I'm looking elsewhere. Right. So, by the way, the problem is always going to be our our sin, our unbelief, and and please connect these two. Jesus tells us that the Holy Spirit comes to convict us of sin in regards to our unbelief in Jesus. So. Don't, don't disconnect those. Don't think of sin primarily behaviorally. 
Think of it, uh, it has a lot more to do with belief. Okay? So, what you believe. So, there's unbelief. My unbelief that there is a perfect spouse that is available and is here and present and he's pursued me. Now, I know for guys that might be a little weird when you say that. You know, like I, I know it's hard sometimes for us to think of Jesus that way, but we are the bride of Christ as the church. And think of it this way. Someone actually wants you. Someone actually is pursuing you. Someone, God actually is proud to call you his own. That's, I mean, every, every, every little boy grows up and says, I want to I know that I measure up. I want to know that I became somebody. You know, you, you are somebody. He pursued you with his own life. You're, you, you, you're fine. You're measured up in Christ. Okay? So then what's my identity, my origin? It's like, it's, it's really that there, that uh, there, I'm sorry, this should be here. There is a wedding feast coming. Okay? I am going to get married. Guaranteed. Okay, so you all can relax if you're going, I want to get married. You're going to. It's guaranteed. Now, some of you might go, yeah, but I want a physical man right now. He's not nearly as good as Jesus. And I tell you what, if you don't believe that and don't get to that, you will actually destroy your marriage wanting your husband to be that. You've got you to be satisfied with Christ as the perfect one for you. And so what's my identity got to be in? It's got to be that I, I'm, I am loved. And that's evidenced by looking at what Christ has done for me in Jesus, okay? Now, let me give you a storyline of a friend of mine who was an unbeliever so you can see, because like this is great for Christians, right? It's pretty hard to tell someone that who isn't true of yet. They don't believe it. So this is good for us. We need to hear this. It's good for our friends, too, because we could say, you know what, you're seeking something that can only be found in Jesus, ultimately. I, I love talking to friends who are having marriage problems. I'm like, the fundamental problem is that you actually want your husband to be God for you. And he can't. I know, he's a jerk. Okay, we got that. So are you. <laughs> you know, so you can have those kinds of conversations, but if they don't believe this, then they only go so far. But it's still something you can give them. You can give your single friends hope. You are wanted. I know you think guys don't want you. The best guy ever wants you. And he did everything to pursue you. And you just don't want it. I love it when people say, I just want a man to love me. I go, I've got, we got the greatest man that ever lived who's pursued you and, and gave his life for you. And you don't even receive it. You don't want a man to pursue you. You want this to be all about you, not about him. And you can have those conversations at some point with people. Okay? Um, we did that with Nikki. Some of you know that. About, do you know who Nikki is? So we got to finally talk to her about the fact that she's looking for the perfect man and the perfect man's already been ch- chasing after her. And she just isn't responding to him. She could respond to the perfect man and she'd get the, the love of her life in Jesus Christ. Finally, she did come to him. She's still a mess, just so you know, just like me. And you know, we're all still working out the truth of our, our new identity in Christ. So. Um, so you have taught them this. Should I do another round with an unbeliever or you guys got it? I'll tell you what, my wife's one of the best gifts in my life because she just talks about Jesus to everybody all the time. She just doesn't, she's not, and, and uh, she has tons of unbelieving friends. Because she's not weird about it. She's not, you know, like slamming it down the throat. They just know Janie loves Jesus. They're like, yeah, Janie loves Jesus. It's no surprise. She's always talking about Jesus. That's great. I want them to know that. I don't, I'm not ashamed of my kids. Why would I be ashamed of him? So, so be known as people who talk about Jesus, you know. Not in weird ways, just open, you know. Like, I, re- I write, when people ask me, well, what do you do? You know, why'd you move to Tacoma? Well, because we really believe that God sent us here to let this city know how much Jesus loves them. So we want, to, we want them to see it by the way we serve, by the way we care, and he loves you. I hope you know that. That's the, if, if, that's, if that's too much for us to say and we think it's going to be offensive, then I don't know where you're going to go. You know, I mean, if you can't even say that and they're offended, I mean, I don't mean, gosh. <laughs> and if they're offended, ask why. And people go like, oh, man, that bothers me. Why? Why does Jesus bother you? I would encourage you just to have more open conversations. And I had someone ask me one. I know I'm not asking, answering questions. So let me give you this and I'll, ask, I'll answer your questions. But I had someone ask me like, so like, are you really open with unbelievers right away? I said, pretty soon into the relationship. I, I'm, not gonna, I, I'm not into any of this hiding kind of bait and switch thing. Uh, I usually let them know, hey, just so you know, like, um, like it would probably be two or three conversations in. Might, sometimes it's the first one, but... 
Just, you know, I'm, I'm, I want you to know, like, I would really love for you to, to just to know how, how amazing Jesus is. And I want to be here if you ever want to have questions about that. Because I know him, and he's, I love him, and he's incredible. Maybe you don't, and, but I'm, I'm available. If you ever want to talk about him, I know him, and I'd love to tell you about him. Just, it's an open-ended thing. They can go, you know what? I'm not really interested. That's all right. If you ever are, let me know. That's how Zia, that's at one point, he's like, okay, I got to talk to you about that. So, you know, don't hide him. Don't be ashamed of him. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation. So, don't be ashamed. It's the only way people's lives are going to get changed. You have the answer. You have the hope. Don't hide it. They need it. Okay? Questions? Yeah. Just uh, you described, like, sort of trying to engage this stuff with individuals. Like, at what? I guess I'm trying to think about, say, you want to have your believing community describing it and describing these things together in your missional community. So you want people to eavesdrop in to go, wow, Jesus is relevant to your lives. You, you talk about him a lot, but, yeah, at, at, but I kind of feel like for some people, for someone to reveal their heart, they're probably unlikely to do that in a mission or community context where there's numerous people around. Is that been your experience? So you kind of want yeah. to eavesdrop and go, well, you guys love Jesus a lot because you seem to talk about him a lot. Mm-hmm. But in terms of them feeling comfortable and vulnerable enough to yeah. reveal their heart, do you find most people do that in the context of those breakfast interactions or have you seen that played out in your backyard as you know, with two or three other blokes? From, you know, My experience is that um, most of the people that I know that are unbelievers to get in a conversation like that, it usually is at a breakfast or it's over a drink or something together after we spent some time. There have been times, though, where we're in, talking around the fire pit and someone, if they've been with us long enough, they'll be like, I, can I ask a question, you know? Or I don't know if I agree with all this, but it, it will take a while. That won't be right away if that happens. But a lot of the guys that I've had conversations with, it generally happens when I get together with them over breakfast or it's usually one-on-one or maybe a couple guys together. And I, I don't know if that's just where I'm at in, in the culture I live in. I do think most guys, when it comes to that kind of stuff, they're not, unless they're like boisterous bullies and, you know, or they like to debate or whatever, they usually don't get that open in front of a big group. That's been my experience. Um, whereas I've seen ladies open up a little bit more in a little bit larger group in our experience again. I live in the Northwest. Women are a little bit more outspoken than a lot of times where we're at, so that may be part of it too. So it could be a cultural thing. But I think it can be, I, I think if you never create other spaces, don't expect to have a lot of conversations. So. Yeah. What do you do when you like, just come against lots of people with gender in the gospel or say no? Because you like, and you say, you get sad. I guess I've experienced a similar thing. What do you do with that? Or how do you channel that? Or um, is it good to keep that? Or where does it go? So when people reject the gospel, and how do, where do, how do I deal with that? Yeah. Uh, I think we need to grieve that with the Father. I think we need to talk to him about our pain. I mean, Jesus wept over Jerusalem and said, how long have I wanted to gather you like a mother gathers her little chickens? And I think it's important that we grieve that with, with him and I do think it's ability to identify with Christ and his re- in really understanding his rejection because he was rejected, you know, and and he still is getting rejected, you know. So I think it can allow us to to fellowship with him in grief over our friends and over the way they are, they reject the one we love the most. Um, so it should really bother us. They're rejecting the one we love, you know. If someone says I hate your wife, that's going to deeply wound me. Jesus is much better, and they're rejecting him. So I think we should. I have a great wife, but um, I think we should be grieved. I think we should talk to the Father about that. I think we should talk on their behalf and, and intercede for them and pray that the, that the Spirit would break in. I mean, I think some of the grief over, over people should lead us to pray more earnestly for them. So, so I think that's some of it. I've also told my friends, just like, I, say, I, I'm, I, st- I will still be your friend. We've had many conversations with one of, one of our friends and I finally told her, I said, I want to make sure it's clear that you, because we had a very, at one point it got really heated. And I came back the next day and I said, I want to make sure you know that, like, whether you ever believe any of this, I will, I will be your friend. I love you. And she said, oh, I already know that. That's why I can have this conversation with you like I do. So she said, I, I, I know that you're going to be my friend. I know that you love me. So I think sometimes reaffirming our, 
affection for them is important. Because I think a lot of people, because they don't know the Jesus and they don't believe the gospel, they think that we're going to accept them or reject them based upon whether they accept or reject what we believe. Because that's what they do. And, um, and so we don't have to do that. We can still, we can show them the grace of God regardless of whether they believe. So I think affirming our affection, letting them know that we're still here, those are really important things to, let them, to have them hear from us. So, yeah. Jeff, when you ask um, provocative questions, particularly Christians, but people who aren't yet Christians either, do they ever, like, you tell some stories about responses that seem to be open, people open to talking about it with you. Do you ever find people feel so exposed that it becomes awkward? Because those provocative questions are exposing, or Jesus yeah. did that. And I try not to do too many of them in, in large groups because I don't think that that's helpful. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but even in small one-on-one situations? Yeah, they've, I mean, people have gotten awkward. And I try to back off if I sense that they're not doing well with it. And I think that this is where we have to pray that the Spirit gives us sensitivity to what they need, you know. And I, I'll tell you that the, the, the best thing you can learn is to walk in the Spirit and listen to Him because you'll, you're better off knowing what He knows and what He wants. And we, I think we tend to like do evangelism in the flesh. And that's why I think it's so weird for us and so hard for us. By the way, it won't be hard if you're walking in the Spirit. So, and if you don't know how to do that, like, let's help you learn. You know, get into a group. We'll teach you how to walk in the Spirit. Set your mind on what the Spirit desires. And by the way, the way you walk in the Spirit is you put to death the flesh. And I know it sounds simple, but if it doesn't feel like death, you're probably not going to be walking in the Spirit. <laughs> Uh, that's how I've taught our church more and more. I'm like, there's a real like, oh, I've got to say no to something. That's going to be painful, and it's going to be resurrection. It's cross and resurrection. That's the spirit life is dying and rising again. It's that constant death and life, death and life. That's spirit walk. Okay? Yes. Yeah, um, you said early on that you know, sometimes we feel like we've got to be two different people, like two non-Christians and two Christians and that kind of stuff. My question is, so... Um, you know when Paul talks about being like a, a Gentile to the Gentile, how does that fit in? To be all things to all men and all yeah. them. Yeah. How does that so what, what Paul is doing there, though, is he's not changing who he is. He's just changing how he, how he uh, speaks in light of what they need. So that was part of what I was saying. Like when I learn how to do it with a Christian, because I have to do the same thing with a Christian. Like I'm, I'm hanging out with different people that are believers, and I have to like think through how do you need to hear this. And if I learn how to do it with Christians... It's that, same tech, it's that same skill. And hopefully the Spirit's given me that insight. So Lord, give me understanding. Help me to really understand their heart. Help me to hear what their heart cry is. Tell me what to say in light of their story. You know, it's all that. I'm doing that with a Christian. I want to do the same thing with a non-Christian. That's what I meant. And I, I think, unfortunately, I think we get lazy with Christians. We don't, we don't do that with each other very well. And so then when we're lazy with Christians, we get lazy with a non-Christian. We do the same thing. So we're not learning how to be mindful of the other, listening, understanding. So that takes care. It takes love. It takes patience. Yep. Did another hand go up? Or do we need to? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Secret question, Jeff. Uh, how do you guide a community to grace as they learn gospel fluency and fail? Yeah. Um, because we have, we have the culture where Christians, we, we are guys unemployed, uh, living with my wife right at the moment. People are learning, they're failing, they're not feeling love, yeah. they're not feeling gospel. Um, how do you help the community through that? The second question was, well, what are maybe some of the first steps to helping a community that's not very good at it mm-hmm. uh, learn it? So maybe what are the first yeah. one or two steps to it? So first of all, the grace thing is answered by the second one, which is they really will have to know the gospel in order to give grace. The thing that's amazing about, you can't preach the gospel with grace unless you're experiencing the grace of the gospel personally. It's what I love about a, the, the community of faith is because you really need grace to continue to go on. So it, it's, it, it, it's an incubator for belief of the gospel. That's what's beautiful about it. It, it forces the, the unbelief to show up. It forces us to need the gospel and so I think it's, help, it's important that the leader keeps asking, is it happening? Like, okay, wait a minute, hold on, group. How are you feeling right now in light of what just happened? Like, do you, do you know you're loved? Do you know you're accepted? You, I saw you get a little defensive. You know you don't have to prove yourself here. 
Like it's doing that kind of work in the middle of it, paying attention when it's not happening and stopping the group from destroying each other with law or something else that they're throwing at them. So I think it takes someone caring enough to pay attention and see, is it happening? Now in terms of first steps, I think I would, I would do, the first steps I would say is, do you know the narrative of the Bible? You know, can they tell the overarching story of God's redemptive plan? That's really important. We have a tool we use it's called the Story of God or the Story Form Way that helps form people in that. Um, you can get that on our site if you want. Um, because a lot of people don't have the biblical narrative, which if you don't know the biblical narrative, it's really hard to apply the truths of the gospel to people's lives well. Because you kind of made the gospel a bunch of points instead of a story. Uh, but when it's a story, I mean, we were, was Zach here? Or did he go back? So Zach and I, you know, we went to the Grounds Coffee Place down in great place. So we're walking out of there. That was great food. And, um, but we're walking out of there, and I said, um, isn't it interesting um, what's happening in most urban centers in the world right now? They're becoming garden-like cities. It's the combo of the organic, earthy kind of, I mean, there's a, a pig and goats. <laughs> petting zoo, you know, they're at the coffee place. And there's outdoor market, and all you guys know it, and and so I'm saying, do you see what's going on here? There's a deep longing for the new creation. That's the, the city like, it's a garden like city. That's what the, it's going to be like. So if I were in Sydney, I would be teaching our people how to tell the narrative of the fact that there was a garden and God put the elements in the garden to make a city. That's the, the minerals that were in the ground. And instead of making a garden like city, they made a city unto themselves with no garden. And it was actually all about brick and mortar and about building a tower under themselves to make themselves like God. And so God had to come and rescue them from the way they destroyed his plan of giving them a beautiful, lush place which culture could be created, gardens could be built, this, you know, architectural design could be be beautifully displaying our wonderful God. And what happened is they destroyed it. And so God sent his son, Jesus, who's the perfect gardener, is going to build the most amazing garden by by tilling out all the weeds of our sin and our brokenness and he's the perfect king is going to be ruling over the city and ensuring that there's a garden in the city that brings life to everyone who comes into it and he's given his own life to per purchase that place for us and he's getting it ready and he's building it and one day we're going to enjoy this garden like city forever with Jesus if you, if you trust in him to be the best gardener and the best ruler of this city. I'd be telling that gospel narrative but see I need to know the story in order to tell the story in a way that fits the city. Or the context, okay? So that'd be one of them. Making sure they know the story so they can do what I just did. Which means they know themes of Scripture. They need to know the themes of the story so they can apply it to the place or the person. The second thing I would be doing is I would make sure they know the elements of the gospel. So Jesus' life, his death, you know, what do they mean? Why are they necessary? Why do we need a perfect man? Why do we need a perfect substitute at the cross? Like why? They need to know all that. So uh, with my mission community, I regularly rehearse. Okay, guys, again, what's the, the, the gospel narrative? What are the key elements? Why are they important? So I, I rehearse that with my group. Then third, I would make sure they all know how to tell their story, making Jesus the hero. Okay, because our testimony is a great way to share the gospel. Uh, we have a tool called, um, is it called Engaging Story? Is that what it is? Or how to tell your story and make Jesus, Jesus the hero, I guess it is what it is. yeah. And so we train our people how to do that. And so in my missional community, when I start a new one, the first thing I do is I say, I'm going to train you all in the gospel, how to tell your story in light of the gospel, making Jesus the hero. And then each week we're going to have someone tell their story. We're all going to listen for these four parts. And where we, we don't hear it, we might ask questions for clarification. So, hey, we heard you talk about your dad and how he was absent. Have you come to, to know the Father's love through Jesus? Has the Spirit has poured that into your heart yet? No, okay, well, let's pray that you do that. So we'll stop and do that. So they, they get practice in listening to each other's story with the gospel ears. And so you do that week after week after week after week. People get pretty good at going like, wow, is Jesus the hero or not? Well, now they're going to get good at listening to other people's stories in light of whether or not Jesus or something else is their hero. So those are three things that I do with every group that I start to lead. So. All right, that's probably enough, eh? I think. You guys look tired? I should be tired. It's like in the middle of the night for me right now. Can I pray for you? Yeah. Father, we are so grateful for your amazing love for us. 
expressed in Jesus the Son. Thank you that while we were enemies, Christ died for us. And if we were enemies and you did that, how much more now can we be confident as sons and daughters that we are dearly loved? Thank you that nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And I pray that you'd assure each man and woman in this room right now that nothing, nothing can change the affection that you have for us. Would you just wash that truth over our own hearts because if we don't know and believe that, we won't have good news to give. So let the good news preach to us tonight. Spirit, would you remind us of the sufficiency of Christ, the love of the Father, and the certainty that you will come and make all things new. You are the deposit telling us that you will finish what you started. So thank you that you will finish It's good work that you're doing, Jesus. We love you. Help us to tell the story. Help us to boast in you. Help us to make much of you. You are so worthy of praise. There's no reason we should shut our lips. You're the greatest thing there is. We pray that you would remind us of that. Help us, Spirit, to speak of Jesus with power and authority, just like you filled the early church with your very ability to proclaim Jesus. We pray you'd fill us and accompany our words with signs and wonders, evidences of your kingdom breaking into this world. We ask for your help. I pray for these men and women that they would rest well knowing they're dearly loved now. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.